Hello everyone, this is Song. I am finally here for the long-promised video on Henry, t Henry VIII and his six wives, inspired by the fact that I have been listening to the Six musical and I have a lot to say, because I always have a lot to say. But I'm not alone this time. With me is my very dear friend, um, the Anvil of History, or the Anvil of Gaming, as you can find him here on YouTube. Say hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, um, Anvil here is actually a history major, or he has his degree in history, so he's here to fact check me because I'm a filthy <laughs> casual. <laughs> <laughs> that and that musical is so wrong sometimes, it's just... <laughs> and, and here's the thing, so he's saying that just from what I've told him... He, he refused to listen to it, and he, proving that he is the sane one of the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> and fun fact, oh. we've been friends for like three and a half years, and this is the first time we're actually having a verbal conversation. <laughs> so this should be fun. Oh dear. <laughs> I, I expect a lot of laughter. <laughs> But I love being able to make people laugh. So, um, so why don't you get started with Henry VIII? Henry VIII, the tutor who wasn't originally supposed to be king, because he was actually the second born of Henry the Seventh. I think it was Henry the Seventh. But a um, yes. the first born, his older brother was Arthur Tudor, who was Catherine of Aragon's first husband. Remember that detail when we get into her. Yeah, and I actually have an irony point on that, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> oh, big irony. <laughs> I, think I, know, I, I think I might know what you're talking about when it comes to irony. But so, Henry VIII, he is very often vilified by historians and fictional writers when in reality he was actually a good king. It's just his... The escapades of his personal life were much more interesting to read. <laughs> and he did have a propensity for the whole off with his head thing. Oh yeah, I mean, his, his two wives weren't the only ones he beheaded. True, there were many of Although them. He, but... is actually, he is actually known for introducing some rather gruesome uh, execution methods, which were used, which uh, I'm not going to get into all of them, but one of them was boiling people alive. Charming. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm glad I didn't know that one. <laughs> um, but yeah, m medieval torture is something I, I prefer not to think about too much. <laughs> Which is why we're just going to leave it there. Good idea. Okay, so you mentioned Catherine Aragorn was originally engaged or married to his brother. Married. She was married, but yes. they never consummated the marriage, which is... Well, actually, we should probably introduce Catherine of Aragon before I get into that first. Okay. Catherine Aragorn. So, Catherine Aragorn was a Spanish princess. I know that much. I think she was the daughter of Isabella. The... Ah, uh, are you sure about that one? I'm pretty sure there was a connection to Isabella, which I noticed because I was watching a... Again, people, I'm a filthy casual. Um, she I, was. <laughs> yeah. She was the uh, daughter of Isabella I of Castile and Frederick II of Aragon, which she got the name from. Yes. And I, I remember that because I actually did a report on Queen Isabel when I was in seventh grade. And I think that was about the time my teacher summoned my mom to the office and said, so, um, Song has this fascination with these really intense people. <laughs> and I don't know what to do about it. Probably would have fit in with some of my history classes. <laughs> well, I, I, I first tried to write a report on Anne Boleyn when I was nine. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Except I was nine years old, and I couldn't find a whole lot of information on her. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I actually went back and found out why. Um, so yeah. Actually, um, really quick, I want to mention my fascination with the Tudors. Because it is one of my favorite things in history. 
And it started when I was nine and I found this little watered down kids book basically on Elizabeth I. And it just really fascinated me. And they gave some weird information about Anne Boleyn that I now know wasn't quite right. But ever since then, I go through these periods where it'll come up and I just have this fascination with the Tudors. And we actually met when I was first <laughs> in the midst of one of those. Oh, so, hmm. You should told me about that, man. I could have given you a couple of papers. I was still in college at the time. No, I did, because we actually talked about it. Because um, Carleen, I had just discovered Carleen, and she oh. had her Ballad of Anne Boleyn album. And so we did talk about it a, a little bit, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I might have even been going through one of my uh, Renaissance and Reformation classes at the time, so... Henry was a big figure in that class. Literally and figuratively. <laughs> no, because you were starting your junior year, and I think you were already into... Because you were studying, like, the Native Americans and Civil War. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So that explains why you didn't get totally excited when I was like, oh, tutors. That would actually make a lot of sense. Yeah, because I know now when I bring something up that you are really interested in, you'll you'll really jive with me on it. Right. So Anyway, where were we? <laughs> so, uh, this is probably going to happen a lot. Just be patient. Yeah. Like I said, it's our first time having a verbal conversation, and it, it's very different from just texting so we were discussing discussing Catherine of Aragorn right. and may I say that I, I don't like the phrase boss babe I hate that phrase but if any of Henry's wives was actually a really impressive queen I think it was Catherine of Aragorn because and I agree to that I mean they were married for what 23 years I believe so and this is a woman who, when Henry was away, a very heavily pregnant Catherine of Aragorn rode out to the front of... She basically led a battle. Like, she didn't fight, but she rode out heavily pregnant, full armor, and basically encouraged the troops. And I think she did have some say over the battle itself. So it's like, she, she was a queen. She was, yeah. she was like everything I point to when. I mean, I mean she was a, uh, she was the daughter of um, Spain's most infinite mon infamous monarch. So I yeah. think you would have to be a badass in order to uh, live up to that. Exactly, and so it, she is everything I point to when people say, "Oh, well, you don't see enough of women in history, or women were." Oh, shafted. open history, huh? Open a history book. Exactly. Yeah, she she's just one of those she's one of those people where it's like or every time they say, Oh, women were just expected to be docile and they didn't get to do anything, it's like uh, uh, no. Yeah. It, it's like in Brave how Eleanor runs the castle. It's like this was a woman's job and it was a big job and it it was really impressive. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> So, Catherine was sent to England to marry Arthur Tudor, and when yep. it came a very big dowry that uh, England kind of needed at the time, and half of it was sent before the marriage, or with her when she arrived, and then the marriage happened, Arthur died before the second half arrived, and they're kind of in this uh, limbo where... England is like, okay, we don't know what to do with her, but if we send her back, we have to send the money back. And we need yeah. that money. So we're not sending we're her back. And Sp we'll very expensive. <laughs> yeah. And then Spain is like, okay, well, we're not giving you the rest of your money <laughs> until you figure out what to do with her. And it's interesting because Henry spent years going, I'm not going to marry her. I'm not going to marry her. Nope, nope, nope. You can't make me. And then as soon as his father died, he shocked everyone by going, okay, I'm going to marry Catherine of Aragorn. Yeah, which is where <laughs> the issue that will come up later in life is he had to get a papal bull that he would be allowed to marry Catherine of Aragorn because in, the, in Catholicism, you're not, you're not allowed to marry your brother's widow. I'm not sure if it's elsewhere like nowadays, but back then... 
Catholicism was still the central power of Europe. So yeah. that's and, very important. And, you know, the irony I mentioned earlier is that biblical law, at least in the Old Testament, was that if your brother died without having an heir, she married the next nearest male relative so that she could have so that the brother could father an heir in his brother's yeah. name. Yeah, but when has the Catholic Church <laughs> ever been straight? Never. <laughs> ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he married Catherine of Aragon and I'm going to let you is, or is there anything of note? They had a pretty solid marriage for almost 23 years. He, she only gave him one child. That would be Mary Tudor. There were some other kids, but the sons that she did have only lasted a few months. I don't think they even made it that, because I believe there were five pregnancies in total. Two. No, she had, she had at least one son who lived for like two months. I think he was uh, named Henry. Uh, yeah, Henry Dufigo. He was named Henry... Uh, Duke of Cromwell, and he was born in uh, January 1511, but he died, like, a couple days later. Okay, yeah, a couple days, but I, I didn't think it was months. No, okay, I thought it was months, but <laughs> my mistake. Yeah, um, he did have a son by a mistress who did live to be 15 or 19? We're not even gonna get into how many uh, bastards Henry might have had. True. Um... That could be a whole series of videos on its own, but we have not we have no time for that. <laughs> well, we may come back to that someday because we know I do like this topic. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then who should come into the picture? Anne Boleyn. <laughs> and so I might go off on this because I'm going to state my bias here. Anne Boleyn is my favorite of the six wives, probably because my introduction to the Tudors was Elizabeth, and it was in such a way that um, <clears throat> the book I found was kind of like a fictionalized diary of what she might have been like when she was 10 or 13 or whatever. And, you know, here's this little red-headed girl, and I'm this little red-headed girl, <laughs> so let's be honest. I related, and this is probably why I have a fascination with Elizabeth, ultimately, and it led to an interest Orb. in... Huh? I was just agreeing with you. Yeah. And so it led to this fascination with Anne because she really is a fascinating character, in my opinion. And this is why I'm so upset with how the musical portrays her. Because they make her this party girl and i mean all the songs think, are, hmm? and i don't think there is a reason to that is because during her rule she was much more interested in the arts than she was ruling i mean we'll get into this when we get into uh jane seymour as queen but anne boleyn as queen was known to have a uh, um sponsored the arts and stuff i mean the palace had a lot more a uh unique artwork and musicians there compared to a uh, Jane Seymour, but again, we'll get into that when we and, get to her. Yeah, and she was also the most expensive of the queens. And the oh, only yeah. other one who came close was Catherine Howard, but in a way, I think that was a, that was a completely different thing, in a way. Um, but Anne comes in, so like I said, the musical makes her this party girl to the point that her, her court, the, her song is called Don't Lose Your Head, and all the songs are kind of dance pop numbers. It's it's like if the Spice Girls were around today. Oh, God. <laughs> and I actually like the Spice Girls. I just don't like music today. But her chorus is... Um, what was I meant to do? Sorry, not sorry about what I said. I didn't mean to hurt anyone. Don't worry, don't worry, don't lose your head something something and then it's lol say oh well or go to hell <laughs> and i'm like this is not anne because anne was and like I, when we were talking earlier i told you there's the line 
politics not my thing oh my god every move this woman made was political you do not um, spend seven years seducing a man playing a very long game which could have disastrous effects because she wasted her most fertile years waiting for henry to get that annulment yeah <laughs> and it if she failed she was done and well she ended up being done anyways but well, in a well true but it's like after all that time she spent playing the game to get henry it she didn't have any second options at That's true. at this point now there is some confusion about anne's age and i'm actually going to make a brief detour off to the side as to a theory i have as to why there's apparently two birth dates for anne and uh oh I'm really quick going to mention Hamilton, because one thing the musical doesn't mention is that after Alexander and Eliza's son, Philip, died in the duel, they had another son who was born afterwards, who they also named Philip. Yeah. And I'm wondering if something similar happened in the Boleyn family, where they had a daughter who they named Anne, but she died, and so then they had another one who they also named Anne because it was a family name or whatever. And there weren't a whole lot of names running around England at that point. This was pre-Shakespeare. <laughs> I mean, it's just a theory, and it may be way off, but it was something that kind of bugged me. Because there is quite a discrepancy in the two birth dates, I think. But there's... I don't remember who it was, but there was a letter sent by a princess that Anne had been a lady-in-waiting lady to who was talking about Anne's execution, and she specifically lists the younger age, saying, oh, she wasn't even 9 and 20, when I think the other age would have her at 32 when she was executed. Like I said, that would make sense. I mean, most of the sources I've seen and read have her being born in, like, 15, in uh, uh, July of 1501. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some who, I mean, yeah, I've seen, like, 1501 to 1507, but... So, yeah, it is kind of weird. I'm again. I believe your. I think your theory might be probably the best one. But <laughs> wow, sorry, high praise. <laughs> okay. But I mean, how many Henrys were born in one time to a royal family? Yeah, and you know, actually, um, when I was listening to the musical, because I haven't bought the album, I've just been listening to it on YouTube, and one of the comments very snarkily was like, do you ever think Henry married all these Catherines because he was too lazy to remember their names? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, it's like royals marrying their kid the same name. Yeah, and it, it's just, like I said, this was pre-Shakespeare. There weren't a whole lot of names running around England. No. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, Back to uh, Anne Boleyn. Yes, please. Before we get distracted and turn this into a different video entirely. Yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So Anne came in, and one thing she had done was she she wasn't strictly raised in the French court the way the musical says. She was also in another court that I don't remember the name of. Like I said, filthy <laughs> casual. She was in the Netherlands. Thank you. I was going to say Holland, but I knew that wasn't quite right. So she said like Holland, Holland is a region, Netherlands is the country. So I was kind of close. Close enough. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like saying I live in the United States, but I live in California, so. Yeah. So Anne, Anne grew up in the Netherlands and in France. And while she was in France, she learned what was called courtly love, which, for those who don't know, is kind of the game of flirting. It had nothing to do with marriage, because it was usually like a woman who was already married and a knight who would wear her favor. It's like, you knew it, it wasn't a marriage, but marriage had nothing to do with romance or love back then. And it was all for power. Exactly. And I think when a lot of people look at historical, I think when a lot of people look at the institution of marriage and they try to do so through a modern lens of romance and love oh, they miss oh. 
Mm -hmm. Let me stop you there and let me just say, everyone looks at everything in the past with a modern sense of it. Of course, but I think you do need to try to take a step back and understand the zeitgeist of the time, so to speak. And yep. Yeah, and like I said earlier when we were talking, I don't think you can really understand anything until you experience it, but I do think you can factor things in to the way you think about them. I agree. Yeah. And so courtly love, and it, it will actually come up again in this whole story. Um, oh, everywhere. Yeah, but it, it was the game of flirting. It was a kind of innocent seduction in a way. And Anne was very good at that. And, yep. and Henry had actually, or her sister, who I believe was named Mary... Mary Boleyn, that is correct. Okay, so Mary Boleyn was actually Henry's mistress before Anne, which is probably yep. why Anne was like, eh, no, I'm not going to be a mistress. I've, I've already seen what happens in that situation. Yep. But Mary was actually the prettier of the two, but Anne is the one who came in and she played Henry like a fiddle, basically, mm. and she seduced him. Without sleeping with him. And I think that was the key to how it worked, was she didn't give him what he wanted, but she gave him just enough to keep him coming back for more. She and, was a team. Yeah, and I think that that's one thing I've always admired about her, is that she played the part brilliantly. She just got to a point... Mm, I want to save that for later. <laughs> we'll talk about... <laughs> why the game failed at the end. Yeah. So, she came in, Henry spent seven years trying to figure out how to divorce Catherine of Aragorn. And... The Catherine... Pope was not helping. <laughs> and Catherine... <laughs> Catherine never admitted that Henry had divorced her. She never acknowledged it. To the end of her life, she insisted she was his one true wife. She insisted that she was the Queen of England, which is really sad when, <laughs> the, when I think about it, because it's... It is, like, the best, like, the biggest case of denying reality I have ever seen. Pretty much, yeah. Well, except for when um, Mary Tudor went on to basically have... I forget what it's called, but, like, she wanted a child so badly, her oh, body yeah. went... Yeah, she, uh, fake pregnancies. I don't think it was even that. It got to a point where she actually had this mental condition where her body put... Her brain put her body through all the symptoms of pregnancy. Yeah, I, I've heard of that and read about it. That's why I've always believed that Mary was a victim as much as she was a villain. I agree. But we will get to, yeah, we'll get to the three kids in a little bit. And so, Anne, once, once the annulment, well, Anne led to complete religious overhaul in England, creating Basically. the Church of England. Yeah, the Pope refused to uh, give Henry a divorce because the Pope had already used a papal bull to say, yes, these two can marry. <laughs> So we're just like, no, I'm sticking to this. So Henry said, well, fuck you. I'm going to make my own church then. <laughs> Which is a very kingly thing to do. <laughs> well, this, I believe this was kind of around the time he was uh, having his mental breakdown. So. Yeah. And, you know, part of that might actually have been the fact that Anne was playing him the way she did. Yep. Which that just occurred to me. But that, you know, being... Being manipulated by someone does nothing good for no. your mental health. And, yeah. So, I, I said I like Anne. I never said she was perfect. <laughs> oh, like any ruler back then was? No, not at all. And so, once Henry finally got the divorce, he, or the annulment, it, it I've seen different statements of whether or not she 
finally slept with him before they were married or after, I'm kind of inclined to believe before. Because there was the secret wedding, like, as soon as the annulment happened. And then they had a public one in which she was already pregnant. Yeah, that is the, uh, I believe that is the case. They had the secret, then the uh, public marriage, and she was already pregnant. Yes, and part of the thing with the public marriage, which I believe also included her coronation at the same time. Yes. Yeah, and she was actually crowned with a special crown. Do you by chance have the name of that? I do not. I have not found it. Okay. Um, I know it was on Wikipedia when I looked it up years ago, but Anne Boleyn has, like, the longest Wikipedia article out of all the wives. <laughs> um, yeah, because she had one hell of a lead-up to the marriage. Definitely. So, but she was actually crowned with a special crown that was specifically reserved for the heir because and the future king, because everyone was convinced... St. Edward's crown. Huh? I found it. It is called St. Edward's crown which would only be used to crown a monarch. Exactly. So everyone was convinced that Anne was going to have a boy. The palace astrologers, the doctors, everyone was like, this is a boy, this is a boy. Yeah, use the special monarch crown because she's pregnant with a boy. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to the irony at the end. I have someone here to help me make sure I don't forget. Don't you dare no, let me no, forget, no, Anne. No, no. Okay. I am not going to forget. Okay. And plus, it's it's one of the big points I've been... We've been working on this video for like three weeks now, I think. Yeah. And, and so it, it's one of the key points I want to bring up. And it was kind of what made me actually decide that I wanted to do this as a collab with you because we were having really good discussions about it. And I was yeah. really enjoying that. And I'm like, I, I want to bring this into the video. And so she was crowned with the special St. Edward's crown. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the child that was born was a girl, which was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Tudor. Elizabeth I. Elizabeth I. And... By all accounts, Henry and Anne both adored her. From what I under, from what I've seen, I've read, and I've seen that too. But I will say this: it, the the birth of be her being a girl was a blow to their relationship because everybody expected a boy. So yeah, and so it didn't lead to some other um, issues in court, like they had to a um, cancel a joust, I believe, because. It wasn't an heir, it was a girl. You know how much Henry wanted his son. Yeah. And th this also brings me to why their marriage fell apart. Because Anne, Anne was actually very much like Henry. They both had these, had very strong personalities. And all the things, like the manipulation and everything that Henry enjoyed when he was pursuing her. They didn't work. Gone. Yeah, they didn't work so gone. well. I mean, it, it's literally just like getting hyped or something, like how we were all hyped for Last Jedi. <laughs> when, we the thing, when we got the thing, we didn't like the thing. Exactly. That was kind of the case with Henry and Anne Boleyn. When he finally had her, he realizes he realized that he didn't like what he got after that long chase they had. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying he hated her, but... Yeah, and, and from what I understand, their personalities just did not mesh well. Coming back to the fact that they did both have strong personalities, and they it probably didn't help how extravagant and expensive Anne was. Because like I said, oh, yeah. she was the most expensive of the six wives in that she her court was lavish. She brought in the French <laughs> fashions... She was the English version of Marie Antoinette, That's which is which is not a uh, compliment, by the way. No, not by any means. Uh, Marie Antoinette has become very romanticized nowadays, in a way. But it it was, and Henry himself was extravagant on his own. He was pretty much always on the verge of financial ruin because he spent so much money. Oh yeah, jousts jousts are. 
jousts are not cheap. Never mind the wars he raged with France and Scotland on and off. Which were pretty much always a failure. Yeah. Yeah, he, he wasn't a very good military tactician. <laughs> fighter and jouster, but when it came to his tactics, they left a lot to be desired. Yeah, and a joust is actually something that played a big part in Henry's madness, so to speak, and all his it's mental health, struggles. It, it was, well, I'd say his health issues in general, sure. because for those who don't know, during uh, one of Anne's pregnancies, he was knocked off his horse in the joust, which caused an injury to his leg. And that injury would stay with him for the rest of his life. It got ulcerous, I believe, and later in life. And it also led to another issue where the stress of hearing that accident caused Anne to have another stillbirth. Or, no, not stillbirth, miscarriage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, peop like you said, Henry is very vilified and just painted in a negative light by a lot of people. And one thing they love to point to is his obesity. What they don't often know is that Henry was actually very athletic. And I believe he was even considered handsome he when was. he was young. I mean, here's... Okay, here, I'm going to add to my personal because I was an athlete. So, in a way, I was in the same position as Henry. Because Henry, yeah, he ate a lot every day, like... I believe I watched, I, when I was doing research, I watched a video of what tutors ate. He was consuming anywhere between five to 6,000 calories a day. But when he was younger, he was very active, so he burned all that off. After his leg injury, he couldn't be active anymore, so he was still eating, and that's when he put on the pounds. Yeah, and he definitely, it was after the injury that definitely kind of, I think the loss of the ability to be active and kind of prove his manhood in that way drove him to pursue women and food even more because what else yeah. did he have to try and prove his manhood? And, and we'll get to the, uh, I'll get more on that uh, after Jane Seymour before we hit Anna Cleaves because there are some good points in there in that two years he wasn't married, but we'll get there. Yeah, and you know, they also talk about, oh, he had all these mistresses and everything. And we're not going to dwell on it, but I just want to point out that was really common back then because it proved the king's virility. And yes. especially with Anne of, or Catherine Aragorn, when, you know, there's so much Catholicism. And I think even with the initial Church of England, it was still that there couldn't be marital relationship, marital relations between a husband and wife while she was pregnant. Because mm -hmm. it was supposed to be used strictly for, are you trying to have a child? Is it not a holy feast day? Whatever. I once saw this flow chart of like when a couple was allowed to <laughs> to have their. Oh, oh trust me. When, uh, we uh, when I was in one of my history classes, uh, one of my uh, teachers' jokes was a uh, peasant asked the Catholic priest uh, when they can have sex, and he lists all the days they can't have sex it, and yeah. let's just say there weren't a lot of days they could yeah and it's like it can't be on a Sunday it can't be on a feast day it can't do this oh and, and are you so many days before and after Christmas oh. yeah and it it was specifically are you trying to have a child no then no you can't <laughs> so anyway yeah but which gets us to our next and very important player in this Jane Seymour. Ah, yes. Because once Jane came into the picture, it was over for Anne. Yeah. And Jane is very much Anne's opposite. She was very quiet and very timid and very gentle. From... And submissive, I'd say, too. What was that? And I'd also say she was submissive, too. Definitely. And so in that so you have him struggling with Anne and the clash of their personalities, I think even more than her failure to have a child, I think he was just kind of done at that point. He's like, I cannot stand this nag who is always giving me, she always has something to complain about. I'm sure it was something <laughs> like that. And so then you get Jane, who is one of Anne's ladies in waiting. And who was the opposite and as such she appealed to him in the fact that 
she wasn't Anne. Mm-hmm. Now she was, also ha- very, she was also younger too, I believe, and also very pretty. Yes. Now, so we were talking earlier about if it weren't for Jane, however, Anne might have lived because what I think was actually Henry's breaking point was a time Anne came into the room to find Jane Seymour sitting in Henry's lap while she was pregnant. Uh, Anne was pregnant, to be clear. And she flew into a rage and she dragged Jane Seymour off of Henry's lap and she just flew into hysterics, basically. And it caused her to miscarry a boy which I think at that point in the pregnancy, it there was a safe bet that boy would have been born and mm-hmm. could have been carried to term and possibly even survived. But she miscarried a son, and I'm pretty sure this whole thing went down and Henry is like, I am done with her. I'm just, no, I'm done. And as so... As such, he got Thomas Cornwall, Cromwell, not Cornwall, Cornwall, someone else... <laughs> Thomas Cromwell to basically manufacture a uh, reason to get rid of her, in which ultimately led to Anne Boleyn losing her head. Yeah, and this was something we actually did talk about the first uh, back when we first met, and I was into the Tudors and everything, and I was asking you, so like, did these things actually happen? Because I had really only heard about Anne in fictional accounts such as the other Belen girl, which is absolutely awful and terrible and horrible and stupid. (laughs) Um, But I was asking you, so like, did, did she actually have affairs? Was there this and that? And you were explaining to me the whole thing about pretty much you'll say anything under torture. And that's how they got all these, or these several men, including Anne's brother, to confess to having an affair with Anne. And all of those men were executed too. All of them were executed, yes. And, you know, Anne Anne then spent months in the Tower because in a moment... Which, by the way, the the Tower of London was not a palace for anyone who's confused by that. It was originally a military structure, which was later turned into a prison. So to go, to be sent to the Tower of London was basically you were good as dead. You were either going to die in prison or you were going to be executed. Yeah. And in a moment of almost decency, Henry decided a queen of England should not be executed by a common axe. I'm going to send for a French swordsman. But negotiating this took a long time. And another reason I like Anne is reportedly at some point someone is explaining this to her of why she hasn't been killed yet. And she's like, I don't understand why this is taking so long. I, it can't be hard to kill me. I have a very small neck. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you know, I have a total gallows humor. So the first time I heard that, I'm like, oh, no wonder I like you. <laughs> it, it, it's the kind of joke I would make, honestly. Yeah, I, yeah I'd probably make that too. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a reason we're friends. And so, uh, however, one thing that I did find interesting in my research years ago, and it's always stuck with me, and it's something we talked to, we talked about back then as well, was the day and the day of Anne's execution, people said she actually seemed like she was in a good mood. Well, I mean, if you spent several months in the Tower of London, you would be happy to get out any single way, any way you can, even that man you hadn't put on the pike. Exactly. And I think she was also just kind of, she was glad to be done with Henry and his games. I I think they were both kind of sick of each other. And at this point, she's like, you know what? It's not my problem anymore. Mm -hmm. So, and then we get to, um, he married Jane Seymour 11 days after Anne was executed. That did not take long at all. Not at all. And but I, I don't think it was a surprise to anyone. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you have anything to say about Jane Seymour? There's really not much to say about Jane Seymour, really. The only thing that is of note for Jane Seymour is 
she finally bore Henry a son. <laughs> Who that's, at least that, outlived. That's how, that's how kind of sad it is for James Seymour. Is that's the one thing she, I could really, that's really she's well known for is she gave him a son. Yeah, I, I, the other day I was explaining this whole history to my mom. And I'm like, you know, Jane Seymour, she, she was great for Henry because she gave him a son and then quieted, quietly exited stage left before he could get tired of her. Yep. And one thing the musical talks about is, oh, she was the one he truly loved. Not necessarily. I, well, um, hmm. I, there might be something to that because when Henry died, he was buried next to Jane Seymour. No one else. True. Yeah. and But it is also possible that he saw her with rose-colored glasses because she did give him a son. And like I said, she exited quietly without being a problem afterwards. Yeah, she, unfortunately, I mean, I've actually read that her labor with Edward was a really hard one. Like, she was in labor for, I think, two whole days before he was born. Two or three, yeah. And back then, medicine was awful, so it was pretty easy to catch things, especially in a labor for that long. So she yeah. pretty much just got sick and died. I mean, she lost so much blood from the labor that it was pretty easy for even a thing like a common fever just to kill her. Yeah. I, I think also, it's even yeah. called, like, birthing fever or birthing yeah. sickness or something. So, yeah, one of Henry's uh, shorter uh, <laughs> But, I mean, not the shortest, about to get to her, but the only one thing she was well known for is she gave him a son, Edward. Edward. I don't remember which one he is because there's a lot of Edwards. I think he's Edward the Fourth. I don't take your word for it. Because when I was looking up a picture of him, I I seem to recall it saying Edward the Fourth. Right. Yeah. 